Welcome back. This is chapter 3.6. This is a two-part chapter. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to cover the first half, which is covering the Renaissance, and then the second half, we're going to cover the Baroque uh, period. So before we get into the Renaissance, though, we got to go back, like I promised. Ooh, I can feel the anticipation out there. Uh, uh, to look at uh, the period of the late Gothic. Okay, uh, so... The Gothic period, as you know, and the Middle Ages in general, um, whether we're looking at the European Middle Ages or the, or the Middle Ages in the Arabic world, so Christian or Islamic Middle Ages, uh, there is a move away from realism. And there's lots of reasons for this. In the Islamic world or uh, within uh, Islamic art itself, uh, religious art, there is a rejection of the image. And this, of course, comes from the Ten Commandments. And then we also see this to a degree in the in the European world uh, where there's a fear of idol worship and we saw that with the iconoclasm and the destruction of images in the Byzantine Empire but just in general there is a move away from realism in art um, for primarily religious purposes but in the late Gothic that begins to change and in the 1300s in the 14th century in Italy we start to see a movement called Italian Humanism. Oh, there's that word again, the big H. <laughs> what, is, what is humanism again? Well, we'll talk more uh, in a minute about that, but humanism is this Greek and Roman idea that is about sort of a human-centered view of the world. We'll, give, we'll get more definitions about that in just a second. But what, how this manifests itself in art very often, at least in the classical Greek and Roman world, was very realistic looking art. Because the idea is you want to create a world that looks like the world does through human eyes. And you want to sort of emphasize the importance of the human body and the human form. And so what happens in this a Renaissance humanist period is you have guys like the poet uh, Petrarch or Boccaccio, who are these Italian Renaissance, or the Italian, not Renaissance, yet Italian humanists, who are rediscovering the text of the ancient Greek and Roman world. And they're reading Greek philosophy and books about art, and they're reading um, uh, all of these kinds of uh, uh, con humanist. Uh, concepts and authors, and it's starting to influence them, and there becomes this kind of uh, push uh, to sort of revive this classical Greek and Roman culture. And, you know, you're also talking about Italy, so this is built, Italy is built on the remnants, the literal heart of the Roman Empire, the sort of major, one of the major bastions of humanism. Now, keep in mind, you know, we're in the, we're in, the, you know, the um, late third or the 1300s here. So we're, you know, 2,000 years plus since, you know, the Greek classical culture. We're, you know, at this point almost a thousand years out from the fall of the Roman, Roman Empire. So this stuff is ancient, uh, even in the Renaissance. Okay. Uh, so, on the left is an artist named Cimabue, and this is the virgin and child enthroned. And this, in many ways, is very typical to the medieval art we've been seeing so far. It's sort of unrealistic. Uh, we have generic faces on the people. Um, we have this rather unrealistic way of creating the folds and the clothing here, which almost looks more like geometric patterns than actual sort of real folds in the clothes. Uh, there's an attempt here at three-dimensional space, but the linear perspective is all wonky and off. Uh, it's just not realistic. Um, and we, you, you know why, because you just saw the video on that. But on the right is an artist named Giotto. Giotto is super important in the history of the Renaissance. Uh, he is, even though an artist that worked a hundred years before the Renaissance, Renaissance really gets started properly, he is sort of the seed from which the Renaissance artist kind of grew and drew from. So why? Well, if we look closely at his work, you can see uh, the three-dimensionality of the, the space and the architectural objects and forms are a lot more realistic. You can also see he's using um, shading and shadow that 
oh, good old fancy chiaroscuro we've talked about to create a much more three-dimensional, solid-looking form. I mean, look at the virgin and child, and they just look more three-dimensional, more robust, more real, like as if they actually have mass, whereas the image on the left here appears flattened. Also, if we look at the faces, we start to see a return of individuality in the faces. So, Giotto is drawing heavily from ancient Greek and Roman art. He is sort of re-injecting and reinvigorating art with this kind of humanist perspective. And what also comes with this humanism is a return of the interest in the individual. And so, for example, Petrarch, uh, this great humanist poet, uh, wrote a book about illustrious men. Boccaccio, another Italian humanist, wrote one about women. So we're starting to see individual individuals matter again, um, <clears throat> sort of outside of a religious perspective. All right. So now we have the groundwork laid. We have this return of humanism. And humanism, you want a definition? Is an outlook or system of thought attracting prime, attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. So human beings uh, are center. Um, also, this idea of a rational view of the world, that humans can figure things out for ourselves. We don't need gods or priests or kings to kind of tell us. We can think for ourselves. The individual can make their own decisions. And of course, this is something the Greeks and Romans instituted with at the advent of democracy and Republican forms of government and all that stuff. Okay, so um, let me move my little window here. Hey! Okay. Um, if we look here, this is Italy, and this is where the Renaissance begins. Why here? Well, partially because it's already sitting on top of a lot of the remnants of classical culture uh, with a, you know, the, the Roman, Roman Empire literally sort of under your feet. Um, and so there's this revival of all this sort of stuff. We're going to be looking at Florence initially, because this is really ground zero for the Renaissance. Why Florence? Well, Florence has money. It has power. It has a lot of wealthy merchant families that are helping invest money into the arts, and uh, this is creating an atmosphere for artists. Um, there's also a change in the way artists view themselves um, in the Renaissance, and this is really important. Um, Renaissance artists view themselves as having a special talent. And they start to promote themselves as one of the great sort of art for art, art as visual arts is one of the great art forms. Why? Because artists imitate God's world. The argument by artists is God make only God can make a tree, let's say, or a sunset or whatever it is. But an artist can make a pretty good copy of that. And so artists have, have a special talent that other people can't don't have. They can copy. They can copy God's world. There's also another Renaissance concept in here that's important, and that's the idea of self-improvement. Self-improvement is hugely pop important in the Renaissance because the idea is that, well, one of the underlying ideas of humanism is that being born human is a gift. The ancient Greeks believed the gods in, in the Renaissance, they believe God has given us this really cool thing, the human body and the human mind. And what can we do with that? We can better ourselves. We can improve ourselves. We can learn things. We can improve ourselves physically. We can um, accomplish things through our own will and hard work. That is the gift that God has given us. So in the Renaissance, there's this idea that to prove your sort of moral value, you have to be in this constant state of improvement. Those who do not improve themselves are not moral people, right? Because you're basically squandering this gift that God has given you by not improving your mind or your body. And if you improve those two things, you improve your soul, you improve your morality. So the question is then, how do you know how do you know you've been bettering yourself? Well, in the Renaissance, the idea is 
through fame, through recognition. If you create something great, then that, should, that will be recognized, is the argument. So, uh, we, we start to see this idea of celebrity and, and the celebration of individuals' achievement as a sort of primary part of the Italian Renaissance, because this all goes back to humanism, right? Uh, humanisms can achieve great things as individuals, and those who achieve great things should be celebrated for them, and they should be recognized. And then uh, all the things that come with celebrity, you know, fame and wealth and all that stuff, is part of the package. So what we're going to see is, in the Renaissance, the role of the artist is going to shift. In the Middle Ages, in Europe, um, artists were simply craftspeople. Uh, you, you learned a trade, and then if you became really good at it, then okay, you were successful. But there was no such thing, really, as a famous artist. And the few famous artists we have seen in the Middle Ages were also famous for other things generally, but you were just a, a skilled laborer. You weren't somebody deserving of fame and recognition and celebrity. But in the Renaissance, this changes for the reasons I talked about. Um, and so we start to see famous artists, and eventually these artists are going to be super famous. And we're going to get some celebrities from this period that are still famous. Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, Titian. Um, we're, we're going to see these, you know, Botticelli. These people whose names are still known today. That's how famous they are. If half a millennia later you still know who they are, that's the kind of fame they were looking for in the Renaissance. Right? Not this sort of 15 minutes of Instagram fame that we have today. Long-lasting fame because you have proven your character and your sort of moral integrity. Okay. So Florence. Florence has a lot of money and it's this very powerful city. Now the, the cathedral in Florence had been under construction more or less for almost a hundred years by the time we get to the early 1400s. And because of war, because of some other things, uh, the, the cathedral was never quite finished. But in, in, 1400, in, in the early 1400s, and I'm sorry, this date is wrong. Let me change this. I should say 1401. I don't know why it doesn't. Um, in 1401, the um, city of Florence wants to complete the doors of the baptistry. Um, the baptistry is the main building where people get baptized. And they decide to have a contest. And this in itself is a very Renaissance thing. The idea that you're going to have a contest where one person emerges from that contest as the victor. And there they are celebrated and become famous. Now, the, the general... The, the historians now say that um, there were actually... there was a tie for winners. Uh, but the, at the time, the, the historians of the day uh, say that one guy, this guy Giberti, the guy on, the, on your right, won the contest. Um, I'm just putting it out there for you. So, here's the contest. Um, the rules are, the, con the, the doors of the baptistry, uh, baptistry are going to contain eight panels, and those panels are going to tell, this, tell New Testament stories. And uh, for the contest, there, there are going to be, um, uh, everybody's going to create the same story, the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, this is an Old Testament story, it comes from the book of Genesis, and everybody is going to get the same materials, the same number of pieces of bronze, which is four, the same amount of time to work, and the same subject matter. So the playing field is more or less equal. And initially, there's like 25 contestants, but it narrows down to two. On the left is a guy named Brunelleschi, who's an older artist and represents sort of the old guard of, of Italian art at the time in Florence. And the other guy is a 21-year-old artist named Lorenzo Gioberti, who's young and brash and full of new, weird ideas. 
And so the contest narrows down to these two finalists. And imagine like everybody in Florence being all abuzz about this. There's, you know, money being bet on this contest, and this is a huge deal. And so the judges look at these two images, and they decide to go with Giberti. So like I said, there are some historians who say this was a tie, um, and Giberti and Brunelleschi both won, and the judges told them, okay, you have to share the honor, but Brunelleschi was not willing to do that. So you're, 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 when you, if you do any research on the own, you're going to find some conflicting stories about this. Um, and that's okay, because sometimes even the things that aren't true can tell us a lot about how people felt about this situation. Um, because the story is, that is told is that Giberti wins. And when he wins, he's very kind of snotty about it. He's young, he's brash, he's new. He didn't even need to use all four pieces of bronze, but instead he uh, only needed two. And there's like this sort of legend about how Giberti goes up to the judges and sort of tosses the two unused pieces of bronze at them. And he's like, yeah, I didn't need those. I'm that good. Giberti out. Bronze drop. So, that probably actually didn't happen. But that's, that's the Renaissance. There's a lot of stories about these artists that you'll read that are not true or only maybe partially true, but they're meant to sort of, sort of prop up the fame and the reputation of the artist even more. So even though these stories might fib a little, they still tell us a lot about the attitude that people had towards these artists and how important this kind of concept of fame was, right? So why did Giberti win? If you look at both images, they're quite beautiful. And a lot of students I've, I've noticed over the years have actually preferred Brunelleschi's because of the clarity of the image. It's much easier to read. And it's much easier to read why. Take a look at it. What makes this story easy to read? Um, negative space, right? You can see the images very clearly. Whereas in Ghiberti's, it's much more complicated. The figures occupy this much more complicated three-dimensional space, sort of intertwined by this rock. Whereas in Brunelleschi, he's divided up the image, image into three distinct shapes, a triangular central area, a circular top areas, and a rectangular bottom area. So his use of negative space and his use of shape have divided the image up clearly, whereas Ghiberti's is much more complicated, but also harder to read. Um, the story, of course, is Abraham and Isaac. Um, the story very quickly is God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, a son that he was promised would become a great leader of men and become the father of nations, and a, a, a son who um, he didn't even think he was able to have because both he and his wife were in their 90s and also unable to have children before. And then they're sort of blessed with this miracle baby, Isaac, who their promise is going to do great things. And then God says, I changed my mind. I want you to sacrifice your child. And so now Abraham uh, has to take Isaac up to the top of a mountain um, where he is going to sacrifice him. And in the story, as told by Brunelleschi, um, and, in, and in, in the Bible, um, you know, the, the angel, uh, as, as Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac, an angel of the Lord comes by and stops Abraham for doing it, from doing it. And this is what Brunelleschi is showing us. He's showing us that, you know, the moment is over. The angel has stopped Abraham's hand. Whereas in Giberti's version, it's, uh, there's a lot more tension the angel flies uh, towards Abraham, but he's not quite there yet. It's like the angel overslept and he forgot his alarm clock or something. He's like, hey, I nothing to do today. I'm just, um, oh my God. <laughs> and then he flies and, and stops it at the very last minute. So it creates a lot more tension and drama. Also, I would say the intensity between 
uh, the father and child. Here's Abraham staring his son right in the eyes as he is about to plunge a knife in his heart. This is incredibly moving and tragic and horrific, uh, this scene of, of you know, a father killing his child. And, and Brunelleschi relieves us of that. Uh, Abraham looks up sort of grace, gratefully at uh, the angel as he arrives. Um, but some other important differences. Um, look at the three-quarters view of this angel where everything else in Brunelleschi's is pretty much in profile. Gilberti gives us this much more complicated view here. Also, the key difference is in Isaac's dis, uh, depiction. In Gilberti's, Isaac is nude. And this is the first instance of publicly nude sculpture and art since the fall of the Roman Empire. So, really, this is the first nudity in public art in a thousand years in Europe. This is, you know, a very small instance of this. I mean, this, this whole image is, you know, a foot tall or so, so Isaac is very small. This is, you know, like an action figure-sized sculpture. And, but at the same time, this is a big deal because this represents a whole new change. Uh, because throughout the Middle Ages, the human body is considered something sinful and evil and a uh, source of temptation. But now with humanism, the human body is starting to become something that should be celebrated because it is God's creation. Now, Brunelleschi loses the contest or refuses to share it, whatever interpretation you choose. Um, but he goes on to great success as an architect. Um, he's kind of bitter about losing the contest, and he mostly focuses on architecture. And he, his great claim to fame, among many, many things, though, is creating the... Can you hear lawnmower out there? Spring is sprung, guys! Um, is creating the dome for the very same cathedral in Florence. And the dome he creates uh, is part of another competition. They sure did love their competitions in the Renaissance. I close the door, I'm back. They sure loved their competitions in the Renaissance, didn't they? So, the cathedral was already completed and Brunelleschi had to figure out a way how to build this dome without using scaffolding because the building was already in use and you couldn't build scaffolding inside the dome. So he decides, first of all, I can't make a traditional half-circular dome. That won't be supportive enough without a scaffolding. So he makes a more like oval or ovoid you know, egg-shaped or half an egg-shaped kind of dome. And then he comes up with this ingenious way of building it. Instead of building it kind of from the inside out or the outside in, you know, if either from, you know, the top of the dome or in, in the middle of the, or under the dome, he tries to, he instead decides it to build the dome from the inside, from the actual interior of the dome and basically build the scaffolding as he goes and then add a, a roof and ceiling to that. So if you peeled away the top of this dome, you would see that basically there's a scaffolding already built in the center of it. This is brilliant. And not only did Brunelleschi come up with this idea, he also invented the machines that were needed to build this thing. So we're, we're you know, we're looking at you know, basically an engineer, a, a, a feat of engineering genius here. Okay. Masaccio is one of the great artists of the early Renaissance. He was a, enamored with the work of, um, it's been a long day, guys. He was enamored with the work of Masaccio was, is one of the great painters of the early Renaissance. He was very much a, a student, not an actual student, but a, a guy who was influenced by uh, the work of Giotto. Um, 
the this that proto sort of pre-Renaissance artist from the Gothic period. And you can see this in in um, Masaccio's uh, work called Tribute Money here, um, with his use of chiaroscuro, creating these sort of monumental forms. But also Masaccio is a pioneer of linear perspective. Uh, he was buddies with Brunelleschi, and they, uh, Brunelleschi and Masaccio, along with some other artists, sort of came up with this formula that eventually became linear perspective, which you all know what that is because you did a linear perspective drawing. But if we were to trace, for instance, you know, all of the orthogonals coming off of the side of this building here, you would find the vanishing point sort of right in the center. Aha, and it creates a realistic three-dimensional space. So realism is really, really important in the Renaissance, isn't it? Um, because it, it emphasizes a more human sort of viewed uh, image of the world. Also notice in the Renaissance this sort of idea of order and rationality. In the early Renaissance you often see images that are very organized. Like when we see groups of people, for example, like these apostles here, they're all more or less sort of lined up in very neat rows. There's this real emphasis on reason and rationality and order in the Renaissance as opposed to chaos. Donatello the great sculptor of the early Renaissance, who was a master of many materials. Here are three examples by Donatello um, in, in stone, in wood, and in bronze. These are three biblical figures. The image on the left is Saint Mark. Now, this comes from a cathedral in Florence called Or San Michel. And uh, Donatello sculpted um, St. Mark here in very much a Greek manner. Uh, if you removed St. Mark's clothes, you would almost, you would pretty much find a Greek classical nude underneath standing in that contraposto position, right? And now while statues, religious statues, Christian statues like this appear completely normal to us today, this would have been really something new in the Renaissance to see a Renaissance subject portrayed in a classical Greek or Roman manner would have been really weird and really strange. But also, he's using the material in a way here to help get us to understand St. Mark's character, his individuality, his personality as a human being. This, uh, this is a man of letters. This is St. Mark is one of the writers of one of the Gospels in the Bible. This is an educated man. This is... Um, uh, a well-read man. And so by carving, by using this marble, he's sort of reinforcing the kind of stateliness and intelligence and sort of command of St. Mark. Over here we have Donatello's, in the middle I should say, we have Donatello's Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, of course, is often viewed as a former prostitute, although that's not explicitly stated in the Bible, but it's kind of assumed by a lot of people, and one of the few women followers of Christ who we know by name from the Bible. And uh, she is a woman who um, sort of gives up her old ways and devotes herself to God. After Christ's death, there are stories that tell us that she devotes her life to helping those who are poor and herself. Uh, she herself takes a vow of poverty uh, and basically lives in very poor conditions in a sort of state of penance and forgiveness, asking for, for forgiveness. And so look how Donatello has sculpted her here. She's old and gnarled. He's, look how he's using this material of wood to sort of describe the hardship of this woman's life, this life of poverty and probably disease and suffering. Um, her zombie-like face and her protruding cheekbones, the, the sort of gnarly, rough quality of the wood helps emphasize that. And on the right is his David. Uh, this David uh, was made for a family called the Medici family. That is D-E, lowercase D-E, capital M-E-D-I-C-I, -I, the Medici family. The Medici family, or the Medici family, however you want to say it really, I don't care. The Medici family um, are a very powerful family. 
in Florence at this time. They were a banking family, they were a merchant family, and they had a lot of money. And in fact, they're funding a lot of the Renaissance. What makes the, the Renaissance art so different is in many ways where the money is coming from. In the Middle Ages, most art was commissioned by the church or by rulers. And they had very strict sort of limitations on how people could make art. You know, a church isn't just going to let you do what you want. A king's just not going to let you do what you want. But these powerful merchant and trading families in Florence gave artists a lot of freedom to experiment and do things they would not have been allowed to do um, before. And this, gave, this is one of the reasons why the, art, the Renaissance happened, because it gave the artists did have so much freedom. And so the image on the right, Donatello's image of David, really, I think, encapsulates in many ways what the Renaissance is about. This idea of artistic freedom, this idea of being sort of able to reinterpret old subject matter in new ways. So here's his image of David, and you'll notice it's nude. This was made for a private garden of one of the, the Medici households. So this would not have been seen in public. So this also gives, David, uh, gives Donatello a lot more freedom. And you know the story of David and Goliath. David is this young man whose town is being invaded by Philistines. Uh, the Philistines say, all right, um, we will let the town go if somebody will come and fight our champion. None of the men in town will do it because they're scared of this giant Goliath, the champion of the Philistines. But little boy David, who I don't know, is 10, 12 years old or something in the story, steps up and says, I'll do it. And David wins over the giant, not through um, his strength, because he's just a small child, but through his intelligence. He takes his sling, swings the rock, it hits the giant Goliath. Goliath is knocked out, falls to the ground, and David goes up and severs his head. And that's what we're seeing here, is David standing on the head of Goliath. Now this in itself is very normal. This is the way David has, was usually shown. It was at the end of battle and David is standing on the head of Goliath. But Donatello has made him nude um, because this is sort of his Greek influence. Uh, Donatello, along with his buddy Brunelleschi, would actually go and make trips to Rome and study the art of Roman statues and Roman copies of ancient Greek statues and he's bringing all that in when he's sculpting this David. And so we see David standing in this contraposto position. But look, this isn't like your typical Greek contraposto. This is a David with attitude. He's capturing the sort of brashness and arrogance of youth here, isn't he? This this is sort of a smart-ass kid, right? I mean, imagine any young, any boy who would be brave enough and full of themselves to stand up to fight a giant of a man. You know, that is, the Donatello is really getting into the character of David here. And that's, that's the point. Take a look at these three figures together. And for the first time, put yourself in this Renaissance mindset. For the first time, these Renaissance are not just sort of telling us these biblical stories, not making pictures or statues of them alone, but they are humanizing these biblical stories. We know St. Mark's character of this strong, intelligent, commanding writer. We know Mary Magdalene's sort of character as a woman who has suffered and lost and given herself uh, to, to great uh, misfortune. And we also can see the arrogance of this young boy who will grow up to be a great king. And the materials that he's using also helps the story. The stone, the marble of Mark, represents the strength and intelligence of this man. The wood of Mary Magdalene sort of represents this kind of gnarly broken quality of this poor, sad woman, and the sort of sleekness of the bronze represents kind of the sensuality and, and arrogance of this young man. For the first time, it's, it's like we've, the, the, the world of art has been in black and white. 
Now all of a sudden we have color. These characters came alive in a way nobody had ever seen them before as individuals that people could actually relate to. This is hum these are humanized characters. Along with an interest in, of course, Christian art in the Renaissance, there is an interest in Greek and Roman mythology, and this becomes a big subject matter. Um, many of these wealthy families like the Medici and other families are raising their children as humanist. They're learning how to read ancient Greek and Latin. They are learning the stories of Greek and Roman mythology. They're reading the great poets and orators and um, historians of Greece and Rome. And they um, are sort of absorbing all this stuff. They know it. And so there's a lot of, of, of mythological images in, in this period. Uh, this is The Birth of Venus by the, the artist Botticelli, who was a great favorite of the Medici family. And this is a story of Venus, who was born fully formed as a woman. Um, this was made for as a wedding gift for uh, a, Medici, a Medici wedding. But I want to look at another image that was made um, around the same time for another Medici wedding. And this is called Primavera. And we're not going to get deep into this because this is an incredibly complicated painting and we don't have the time. But it's a fascinating painting because it, it shows, first of all, the sort of depth and understanding that these, the, these sort of young Renaissance humanists had of ancient Greek and Roman mythology and how integrated it was into their society. It also gives us a lot of information into into uh, the society of these wealthy families like the, Medi the, the Medici family. All right, so this is made for a wedding and it is an image of Greek gods basically in love. We have Venus, the goddess of beauty and love in the middle with her son Cupid, um, the god or Eros, Greek, depending on if we're looking at the Greek and Roman version, a, 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 a love god floating above her. Uh, on the left, we have the god Mercury. Oh, and I have all these labeled, or I should. We have the god Mercury, uh, the, a messenger god, also a healing god, a protector god, um, and the three graces, um, goddesses of beauty who represent sort of their higher kind of aspects of, of our human condition. On the right, we have Flora, sometimes called Primavera, a goddess of spring. We have Chloris, who is a nymph, a woodland creature. A, a, and we have Zephyrus, the god of the west wind. Now, on one level, this is simply an image made for this young couple, and it sort of gives us a romantic kind of a view of, of these Greek gods and goddesses sort of in this beautiful garden. But it's also about what is expected of this young Medici men and bride and groom uh, as they start to take on the responsibilities of the family. And in fact, there, you'll notice this is in an orange grove. Oranges were one of the symbol of the Medici family. So it's ex pretty explicit here. And the idea is that um, the man should be the protector of the home. And so we can see Mercury here holding back a storm protecting these three graces who represent sort of the wife. Um, but also, the man should be in charge of his home and should be in charge of his wife. And this is where it gets a little brutal because we're looking at an image of sexual assault. Uh, Zephyrus is attacking this, this nymph, Chloris. This comes from Greek mythology, which unfortunately is filled with images and stories of this kind of sexual assault. Um, there was a Renaissance belief that women were irrational and needed to be controlled and civilized. This is not by belief, these are Renaissance beliefs. And so that is part of the idea here is that this man is sort of controlling his household, he's controlling his wife. And in doing so, he is, morph he is metamorphosizing her. Because in the original myth, Chloris, by this act of sexual assault, 
is turned into the goddess Flora, this or or, or uh, Primavera, which means spring. And you'll notice that there is this stream of flowers coming out of Cloris's mouth because she is wild and irrational in this creature of the woods, and she just kind of spews growth. But now, as she transforms and morphs into Flora, it turn this these wildflowers turn into a dress, and you'll notice that Flora is pregnant. Venus is pregnant, and it's even arguable that some of the graces are pregnant. But the idea is that the, the woman's primary role is to be that of mother and to keep producing Medici offspring. Also, she needs to be graceful because this is a woman who will um, spend a lot of her life in public representing the family, and she must exude grace. And then in the center is an image of Venus, a goddess of beauty, but also a mother figure. And this is, this is important in itself because this is ultimately what is expected of this couple is to keep this Medici family going. Because, you know, when, you, when these two powerful families got married, it was a business merger, guys. It wasn't really about love. It was about consolidating power. But you'll also notice this Venus figure is wearing a shawl or a robe or a covering that is red and blue. The colors of, you know this, the Virgin Mary. This is something called syncretism. It's over here on the left. Syncretism means when two or more even religious ideas are sort of combined. And so we have an image here that can be interpreted, yes, as the goddess Venus, but also as the Virgin Mary, sort of the ultimate example of Christian motherhood and, and female perfection. So this is an incredibly complicated image, and it's a little icky, I will admit, with its sort of images of, of assault. But it's something that, you know, was made for people who had grown up in a humanist with a humanist education and would have been able to sort of understand the various layers of meaning in an image like this. The High Renaissance. I need to take a break. The High Renaissance um, is the latter portion of the Renaissance. We're really going to be, if the early Renaissance is the 1400s, the High Renaissance is like the first two decades of the 1500s. So the High Renaissance is really the time where we get these superstar artists, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo, Bramante, um, etc., etc. We get Venetian masters like Titian and Giorgione. Um, so you can sort of read here about these various artists, um, but let's just jump on in and, and define what we mean by High Renaissance. So first of all, what we're going to see in the High Renaissance is kind of a shift in the way artists are seen. In the early Renaissance, we already see artists kind of taking up this sort of idea of celebrity. And we're going to see that explode in the High Renaissance. And in 1550, in fact, uh, we're going to see the publication of the first art history book by Giorgio Vasari called The Lives of the Great Artists, uh, which you can see one of the covers over here, which uh, we see an image of Michelangelo. And this, this book sort of encouraged the view of artists as intellectual, divinely inspired, creative geniuses versus makers of crafts. So this, these concepts that we've been seeing since the early Renaissance are really coming together here. This idea of that artists are special people uh, and they should be celebrated. And that's kind of what this book does. This book traces the history of artists since like Giotto really and talks about how awesome they are. Moving right along. All right, so characteristics of the High Renaissance. Aspire to beauty over strict adherence to realism. Individual expression is of more, most importance. Uh, we also see a, sh a shift from, <clears throat> from Florence to Rome. Um, and also we're going to see the importance of m one artist in particular, Leonardo da Vinci, who's going to influence all other High Renaissance artists and their attitudes. Um, and then we're going to see this all kind of put together in uh, the lives of the most excellent painters. So, 
Leonardo da Vinci. We've already talked quite a bit about him in this class, so I'm not going to get into his backstory or everything. But I do want to talk about his importance as a high Renaissance artist and talk about these concepts we've been looking at. Um, we've been talking about um, especially that individual expression is most of them is of most importance. Uh, it's more um, so in the early Renaissance, the idea was that you wanted to be as close to nature as possible because your your job as an artist is to replicate God's world. But in the High Renaissance, we start to get this idea that that's not enough. That actually, what artists need to do is express themselves as individuals, and this will lead to changes in art um, that move away from nature. And we can see this in Leonardo's most well-known work here, the Mona Lisa, which we've already looked at a little bit in this class. Um, this is the Mona Lisa. It's a portrait probably of a woman named Lisa Gerardini. Um, it is a, a, a portrait <coughs> of a woman, and she is framed into this triangular shape. Now, we've already talked about the use of triangular shapes and composition uh, since really the first week of school, and this is something Leonardo really brought to European art because it, br it brings your eye in, it creates this really nice composition, and, Le and, Mona and the Mona Lisa forms very much a triangle here. Um, now, this is not a normal position for somebody to sit in. You don't often see people arranged or in triangular positions, but Leonardo used it because it's a strong compositional element. It looks good, but it's not realistic, right? Also, you'll notice that in most of Leonardo's paintings, they're going to have this really fuzzy, hazy kind of look. The word for this is sfumato, which literally means smoky in Italian. And the world doesn't look like this. The world doesn't look like there's sort of a nice Instagram filter over everything. But Leonardo thought it looked beautiful. He liked the way it looked. He looked kind of made everything look sort of dreamlike and a little sensual. And so he paints everything with this kind of smoky atmosphere, which is not realistic at all. And then sort of uh, the third element uh, that Leonardo always goes back to, triangles, fumato, and this background. Look at this background. Where is this place? Is this Italy? That is not Italy. Where is it? Middle Earth? Is that, is that, is that Bilbo coming up the road here? Is that... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Anyway, no, it, it's Leonardo's imagination. It's a place that he wants to see. It's a place that he has perhaps dreamt about. A place that, you know, represents something personal to him, but it is not reality. There is no place in the world that Leonardo would have ever seen that looks like that. It is his pure imagination, his artistic expression coming to the fore, or I should say, literally, background of this painting. We can see these other, these techniques here in his Last Supper, the use of triangles everywhere. In fact, he groups uh, the various apostles into smaller triangular sections. Uh, Leonardo also experimented. He experimented with paint. The, you know, the, the Mona Lisa is in, in terrible condition, and partially it's because Leonardo was trying to work with a technique where he was using tempera paints on a dry fresco, and it didn't work. It didn't work at all. In fact, this painting started peeling almost you know, within like a few months after he created it. And it's been restored several times over the years, but this is also another aspect of this high Renaissance attitude that I'm an artist, I'm going to express myself, I'm going to do what I want. And if I want to try this crazy technique where I mix tempera paints and I mix, mix oil paints together, then so f be it, right? <laughs> um, so Leonardo kind of lays the template for all other high Renaissance artists to follow. One of those is Michelangelo. Michelangelo and Leonardo didn't get along. In fact, Michelangelo and a lot of people didn't get along because Michelangelo in many ways is sort of the anti-Leonardo. You know, we've talked about Leonardo's personality and how he was well-liked and this guy that, you know, was very much appreciated. And, um, Michelangelo is very difficult. He was very hard-headed. He was very arrogant. He was very opinionated. Um, also, where Leonardo grew up, you know, to a single mom and grew up in, in sort of you know, less than uh, great circumstances, 
Michelangelo grew up as a family uh, in a family of sort of a minor nobility. His father was a well-respected man and had aspirations for his son that did not involve him being an artist. Even though his parents humored Michelangelo as a young child, um, as he got older, it was you know he was pretty much informed by his his family that he was expected to pursue a position in life that was more fitting of a man of noble blood. But Michelangelo did not want to be, uh, he only wanted to be an artist. And uh, eventually he basically leaves home and he's more or less taken in by the, the Medici family. There they are again. And the Medici family have this school, a humanist academy. And Michelangelo is privy to this sort of upper-class humanist education. And he learns, you know, not only Greek and Roman stuff, he's also exposed to the great artists of his day and before. Okay. Um, he, leaves, he leaves Florence with the Medici, who are actually exiled from Florence for a while. And he goes to Rome, and it's in Rome where he really starts to make his claim as an artist. The image that you're looking at on your right is an image that Michelangelo did as a student. He was, you know, something only like 12 or 13 years old when he painted this image. It's actually a copy of a German printmaker um, um, artwork, and this was very common. Uh, you know, young artists would go and study with an apprentice, or they, I mean, they would go and study with a master artist and serve basically as an apprentice artist. They would often be sent off at a very young age, and they would learn from their master artist. And one of the way they trained was by copying other artists' works. And so it was not uncommon for, other, for artists to, you know, paint exact copies of other works of art. And that's what more or less Michelangelo has done here. That still should not take away from uh, his obvious gifts and talent at a very young age. I'm also showing you this because you can go see this in person. This, if you are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, this is at the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth. And it is an incredible gift that we have in the Metroplex, the first known work by Michelangelo one of the great artists of all time, and it's literally down the street, and it's free. So go see it. It's awesome. Michelangelo had gone off to Rome, and he's already making a name for himself, and then he decides that he is going to um, try to get a job, try to get this commission to create a statue of David for the um, Piazza della Signora, um, basically, the think of this as the city hall of Florence. Then they are wanting to design a massive, a 17-foot tall statue of David. David is sort of a symbol of the town of Florence. David is like the, the little boy who slays the giant and grows up to be king. And that's how Florence identified themselves. They were this little city that eventually accumulated great power and prestige and became one of the most powerful cities in Europe. And they saw, they identified with David. So images of David are all over Florence. And so it's fitting that the sort of mascot of the town would be built right in the front of City Hall. Um, the block of marble, which was huge um, and referred to as the giant, um, was, uh, had already been carved into. So this made David, uh, Michelangelo's task already very difficult. He had to carve around what other artists had tried to do and already failed. And eventually he completes the statue and he completes what is called David, 17 feet high. So if you were standing next to David, your head would be, if you were like my height, 5'10 or so, your head would be somewhere around his hand. <laughs> This is a, or even below, this is a massive, massive sculpture. Uh, it's, it's huge, guys. And it is, in many ways, a, a Greek nude, right? Telling a biblical story. Um, and you can see the contraposto. I have a Greek nude, the spear bearer, uh, bearer over here, uh, Doriferous, um, my polyclitos over here to show you the similarities. But there are also some key differences. 
from not only Greek nudes, but also Davids that have come before, most notably Donatello's David. You'll notice that Michelangelo's David is older. Instead of a boy, he is a man, which is not biblically accurate, but here is, here is Michelangelo doing that high Renaissance thing and considering his artistic expression over sort of biblical accuracy here because he's wanting to tell the story his way, so he's going to make David older. Also, he's bucking with tradition, and instead of showing David after the battle, which was traditional, he's showing us a David before the battle. He wants to show us a David who is ready and prepared, a David whose face is full of focus and strength and resolve, a David who is not just physically prepared with his sling over his shoulder and this sort of swagger in that contraposto. This isn't normal Greek contraposto. This is swaggery contraposto. This is a David who is self-assured. Because this isn't just a David telling the biblical story. This is a Renaissance humanist David. This is a David telling the story of all of us, all the potential that we all have for greatness. This is a David who has spent his life preparing for this moment. And now that this moment to prove his greatness has come, David is prepared, he is ready, he is resolved, he is focused. He knows that he has the confidence and he has the confidence that he has the ability to complete this task. And that's what the Renaissance is about. It is about this obligation, in a way, that we all have to be the best we can be, to be prepared, to be the man, right? Not the boy, but the man or the woman or the adult, right? That we need to be to get stuff done. And when that, that, that contest, that moment we, that puts, presents itself in front of us to prove ourselves and to be the best person we can be shows up, and we are prepared, then we will be victorious. We will win. We will, like David, uh, reap the benefits of our hard work. And we will become the king or the winner or the whatever it is. But if we don't, if we squander this gift that God has given us, or the gods have given us, if you're going the traditional Greek humanism here, then we, we fail. And we all have moments in our life like that, don't we? We, have all mo we all have those moments where we have been not working, where we've squandering our, our talents or abilities or our time. And then the moment comes where we sh should have gotten that scholarship or we should have won that award or we should have done this or that or the other, gotten that job or whatever, and we didn't. Because we have not been putting our best forward. But then there are those moments where we have, right? Where you do get the scholarship or the job or the reward or whatever it is because you have been putting in the work. And that's what this is about, the potential, the potential we all have for greatness. And that's why he's showing us the moment before the battle. He wants to show us David's preparedness. Not the fact that he already wins and it's a done deal like the traditional David over here with Donatello. But this is a, a David who, who has the potential we all have as long as we work for it. That is what this sculpture is about. And that is why it was considered great from the beginning. Because it resonated with the people of Florence. It resonated with those Renaissance ideals and those humanist ideals. Michelangelo did not like to paint. He much preferred sculpture. For him, sculpture was something real. It was literally three-dimensional. You could walk around it. And for, for Michelangelo, um, his life's work was going to be a tomb, the tomb of Julius II. We've talked about this, so I'm not going to get too far into it. Um, and he was taken off of this task. Uh, the Pope, Julius II, ran out of money. And instead, he said, you know what? <clears throat> we can't do this tomb. That I know is going to be your life's work. It's going to be your masterpiece, but we can't do it. I want you to paint instead. <laughs> Michelangelo is devastated. He's upset. He doesn't want to do this. He's angry about it. But he can't argue with the Pope. So the Pope tasks him with painting a ceiling of a chapel. 
located at, in the center of the Vatican, right next um, to St. Peter's Basilica, and to paint this chapel ceiling. And it's huge. It's a, you know, 128 by 45 foot fresco that takes him four years to complete, depicting primarily the opening chapters of the Old Testament. And this is a physical feat for Michelangelo. You can see what he says here. He's like, I've grown a goiter from this torture, hunched up like a cat. My stomach squashed under my chin, my beard's pointing at heaven, my brain's crushed, my breast twist, my brush is above me all the time, dribbling paint on my face just like, a like it's a floor full of droppings. My haunches are grinding into my guts, my ass hurts, every gesture is blind and aimless, my skin is hanging, my spine hurts, it's knotted up, I'm pulled like a, taut like a bow, and I'm stuck like this, and I'm going crazy. My, my, my mind is full of, he says, a perfidious tripe. It's full of just crap right now. I'm going nuts, I can't think straight, and I'm hurting. When will this be done? <laughs> you know, I am not a painter, he says. This is a letter to a friend, he wrote. And this was difficult for Michelangelo. He spent four years on top of a massive scaffolding, like 70 feet in the air, trying to get this thing done. But what he completed, what he ends up creating, is the great work of the Renaissance, a work that is in many ways the culmination of all of the Renaissance humanist ideas up to that point. It is the story of creation. What is more Renaissance than the idea of making something, of, of creating, of leaving your mark? If man is copied after God, if we are made in God's image, as was the thought at the time, and what does God do? He makes stuff. That's what the Bible starts with, is God is a maker, right? He creates things, and so human beings create things. And so what's a more fitting subject matter for the Renaissance than the story of creation? In the central panels, we see the creation of man and woman with... Um, Take, kind of taking up the, the, the major, the, the three central panels. Um, but throughout, we get the story of creation. Um, we also get images of prophets who prophesied uh, the coming of Christ, because we are still dealing with a Christian culture. Um, but here's the central panel, the story of the creation of man. And just like with David, Michelangelo is giving us the moment right before things happen. Um, Adam is not complete. He's complete in body, but he's not complete in mind. He lies there limp. His hand barely even, he can even raise it up. His head sort of rolls backwards. And then here comes God, floating in this sort of great kind of cloak. And as he approaches David, I'm sorry, as he approaches Adam, <laughs> you'll notice their fingers are about to touch. Potential, right? The moment before the big event. This is Michelangelo's thing, man. And they're about to touch. And we know what's going to happen. We know that that mind, that spark, that intellect is going to get into Michelangelo's, I mean, get into Adam's brain. I can't think of people's names. And he's going to stand up fully formed and ready to go. And he's going to go out and start naming stuff, right? He's going to start making things. He's going to start doing what people do. But not without that mind, without that drive, without that thing that makes humans humans. Renaissance, humanism. People everywhere. Um, Michelangelo to sort of reinforce this idea of the importance of people. Um, throughout the entire painting of the Sistine Chapel, filled with over a hundred figures, has created what were called innudi, or nudes. Uh, innudi is the Italian word. Uh, these nude male figures who are meant to represent 
the glory of the humanity, the glory of the human body. And they flank all of these different biblical images. He also has filled his images with sibyls. What are sibyls? Sibyls are actually Greek um, uh, uh, prophetesses. They are women who were thought to uh, be in contact with the god Apollo and they would be able to tell the future. They, these are Greek figures in an in a inherently Christian painting. But this is the Renaissance. That stuff is going to happen, right? Um, and these are meant to sort of serve the same idea as the prophets were, to sort of foretell the coming of Christ. But they're also a reference to Greek and Roman beliefs, which are sort of co now intertwined and kind of coincide with Christian beliefs in the Renaissance. Twenty years after he did the sealing of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo was asked by a, a um, another pope, uh, Clement the I think the fourth, um, to I'm sorry the seventh, Clement the seventh, to um, paint another uh, image in the Sistine Chapel. This is going to be on the wall though. This is on the west wall of the Sistine, and it's the Last Judgment. And it's another big, massive image with lots of figures. We're not going to focus on it in too deeply, but I did want to talk about this image here of uh, St. Bar Bartholomew, who was tortured by being flayed alive. And Michelangelo has, has basically painted himself as this sack of skin. It's really grotesque. But this is him complaining. He, wanted, he just wanted to sculpt. That's all Michelangelo wanted to do. He just wanted to sculpt. And popes kept on hiring him to paint. And he felt like he was being tortured. And so he's doing a little wah-wah, cry for me here, by putting himself in as this flayed flesh. It's kind of funny. Raphael. Raffaello Santi. Um, the youngest of the big three Roman artists. Um, his dad was a painter. Uh, he trained in Umbria. Um, he studied in Florence. Uh, he got his start sort of painting lots of images of Madonna and children, and that sort of made him get got his name going. Um, he he moves to Rome, and there he learns from these older artists, Michelangelo and. Leonardo, and he takes their ideas. He becomes very popular. Um, Raphael was um, actually relatively young uh, when he died. He was, I think, 37, so uh, he died of a heart condition. But he was a guy who achieved incredible fame. He was friends with the higher-ups of the Catholic Church. Um, he was basically the artistic advisor to the Pope. He had tremendous power and influence. In many ways, he's the sort of dream of what artists could become in the Renaissance, and he sort of achieved a magnificent celebrity. In fact, when he died, Raphael was buried in the Pantheon. Basically, Rome shuts down, and there was like this huge parade, and he dies and is buried in the Pantheon alongside kings and popes and saints. An artist... A hundred years before, this would have been considered ridiculous. And now here he is uh, with this incredible amount of influence. Okay, so let's, let's look at his, arguably his most famous mature work. This is called The School of Athens. And uh, I'm going to move through this rather quickly. But this was one of four large-scale paintings painted in the room of signatures, uh, the Stanza della Signa uh, Signatura, in the Vatican. This is the room where the Pope signs really important papers and treaties and things like that. And the four paintings were on the four branches of human knowledge. Whoops, knowledge, theology, uh, or theology, law, poetry, and philosophy. And this is a painting on philosophy. And that's its official title, although it's popular, popularly known as the School of Athens. Athens, the birthplace of Greek philosophy and all real classical philosophy. 
Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, they all sort of emerge from this school of Athenian thought. And this is considered by many to be sort of the basis of European culture and European ideas. And so um, Raphael has kind of painted this sort of who's who of, of, of these different philosophers. Now these people lived across the classical world, so many of these didn't even live at the same time. I mean, you know, if classical Greece is, you know, 5th century BC, and, and then Rome collapses in the 5th century AD, we're looking at a thousand years of philosophers here, and mathematicians and, and other kinds of big thinkers. Um, mostly from the classical world, although there are, there's one guy from the Arabic world here. But these are um, classical thinkers. In the center we have Plato and Aristotle. So in many ways, the two foundational thinkers of classical Greece. And Plato is pointing upwards because his philosophy involved the heavens. And Aristotle is pointing downwards because he was an empiricist, meaning that his philosophy was based in, and rooted in the real world and what you could see and observe. And then everybody on Plato's side, all these philosophers are basically team Plato. They're Plato. They, they sort of come out of the Platonic branch of philosophy, and everybody over here is team Aristotle. And he's done something interesting, Raphael has. He's modeled the faces of these men on Renaissance artists of his day. In fact, um, down here, number 13, the philosopher Heraclitus is modeled after Michelangelo. Um, um, Leonardo is Plato. Uh, Raphael is over here on the right. Let me see, he's 21, so you can read that. Um, he's maybe protogenous. There's argues about who he is, but, um, you know, there, there's... Uh, they're playing roles. So why, why are they doing this? What are they saying? What is the, the, the central concept here? The idea is that the people of the Renaissance are like the great minds of their time. They're following in the footsteps of these great classical thinkers. And keep in mind, this is in the Vatican, the center of the Catholic faith. This is an image about philosophy, about about human thought. And notice every single philosopher here is a pagan philosopher, not one Christian. Now, there are Christian images in these other in the other three paintings, certainly, and in the one on religion, it's all Christian. But isn't it fascinating? That's how integrated in the Renaissance in many areas classical thought and Christian thought were becoming. In fact, the Pope who commissioned this, Julius II, modeled himself after the great Roman emperors. This is a Pope who calls himself not a Christian name, not Peter or Paul or John, or a Christian idea like clemency, but calls himself Julius, after Julius Caesar. So this is very much a, you know, a classical humanism is sort of reaching its, its apex here. And that about wraps it up now for uh, the, most of the High Renaissance. Uh, next time we're going to continue with looking at the art of Venice and uh, look at the art of the Northern Renaissance. And then we'll be moving into the Baroque period. All right, guys, so um, see you next time.